um, the um, founder uh, and senior teacher of the Israel Insight Society. And I just want to give you a taste of how amazingly um, beautiful the uh, Dharma is growing in Israel, a difficult country. But we have, in just our organization, 42 retreats in the year, a couple of thousand people sitting retreats, many, many young people that have just been through the army and want to go on retreat. Um, and we have programs for peace uh, making with Israelis and Palestinians inside the uh, uh, Dharma organization. I'm involved in all of that. Uh, we have programs for the elderly. We have programs for cancer patients. Um, so we're very engaged in society. Uh, and everything happens on Dana. 42 retreats, all on Dana. Just, and I was really appreciating uh, Gil's center, that, uh, one of the few that is li like that as well. But I just want to give you a taste of something, you know, that to me is a story that just gives a sense of the, uh, the interest in, in Israel. Um, I published a book in Hebrew uh, a couple of years ago called um, uh, Daily Life Awakening. And uh, it's not a beginner's book. It, uh, it's a view, it does show a view, an awakened view, how it shifts completely the way we experience daily life issues, sickness, conflict, um, money, work, and so on. But it goes on to working with the samadhi, working with concentration, working with emotions, working with equanimity, and it goes all the way to awakening. So it's kind of not a beginner's book. And I was shocked because it was 18 weeks number one bestseller in the country on non-fiction books that means the population were really fascinated with a book like this um, it's not the ego the, I don't care it wasn't me but what's interesting is the hunger and something very weird happened out of it which you 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 won't you won't believe this so students sort of asked me, uh, will I come and talk to them in the pubs and the bars? And I said, okay. And I went round, I've been going round 30 pubs and bars in Israel under the title Buddha in the Bar. <laughs> <laughs> and giving meditation and people with their beers, you know, sitting there with a beer and going into meditation 20 minutes. 100 people in the bars, it was always full. Uh, what it tells me is the hunger and especially young people who are faced with a life which is really challenging and anxious today and I don't think just in Israel and um, they really want another view so when the young people come to me and say if I practice mindfulness will I be happy and everything will be fine no. Mindfulness is great, but the Dharma is a view which is much bigger than mindfulness. And so I was able to, I'm going out into the population giving a view, the view, the Dharma view. So tonight, um, what I'd like to do is take one aspect of the Dharma which is way beyond mindfulness. Which mindfulness is really needed in, in its base, but it's way beyond that. And I thought that that would be, and especially because years we've been doing work with peace and conflict in the Middle East. So I want to really talk about um, transforming conflict. And conflict is in our own lives. It's not just between Israelis and Palestinians and between Democrats and Republicans or between Brexit. I'm British, as you can t tell. <laughs> uh, between Brexit, or this kind of Brexit, or another kind of Brexit. Conflict is in our life. We wake up in the morning and our kids or our 
partner shouts at us or we go to work and the boss doesn't like something or we struggle with somebody. It's daily life. Conflict is really about our daily life. It's universal. And it happens really, really fast. And, um, and of course, it's in nature. I, I, have a, I live in an ecological uh, uh, village and I have some chickens. I don't eat them. I eat the eggs. But I was shocked one day to see that the young cocks killed their father, the older one, the old cock. And I thought, my God, nature is tough. But we are, we are doing the same. We do experience even just difference in views, where we have a view and someone faces us with the opposite view. We feel contracted and we feel pressured. It, it, this is daily life for us, and so it's important, I think, to w look at this. And it's often, despite the best intentions, you'd be amazed how in peace organizations in the world, the boardrooms are full of fighting <laughs> on the best way to make peace. <laughs> it's, it's despite the intentions. It's very, very basic. It's very in the guts to be defensive. And... Um, and it's painful, and we can feel helpless. And sometimes, it for us is a test of the Dharma, and we think, well, if I, I've been meditating 10 years, and if I still argue with people, maybe the Dharma doesn't work. That's not true, the Dharma works. But we have to understand the forces here. These are very primal. This is built on the self. The Buddha said, conflict will only stop if there is no attachment to our interests and our defense and our survival and what we want and what we think we need and if we have no attachment basically no attachment that's the only place we'll end conflict so it's very very primal uh, and, and the Buddha sometimes couldn't deal with conflict in his own community there were a bunch of monks that, you know, fighting each other and he, he, couldn't, he couldn't do anything about it. He ran away to the forest. Yeah, it's, it's a, there's a sutta on that. And in the forest, by the way, he met an elephant. And the elephant also was running away from the elef other elephants saying, I'm also in conflict with other elephants. And it's so it's very biological and very basic. So we shouldn't feel that we fail if we're in conflict because we have to understand it's based on the survival, based on defense, based on the self, based on some basic attachments. And so we need to be soft with ourselves and say, yes, conflict can happen, never mind 10 years of uh, meditation. It can and it will, and that's okay because we're human beings. So I just want to, um, want to just mention that um, the, um, <clears throat> the power of conflict, what makes it so powerful, is the investment of the self. So the self is like a, um, a, um, a system, an uh, operating system, which is operating to defend. Actually defend the body originally, but in the end it defends itself. So the self is constantly defending itself. And that gives it a lot of power. So let's look at um, some ways forward with uh, uh, how we're going to work with the conflict. And um, I'll give you here and there stories from uh, my experience with Palestinians and Israelis. So the first thing is, um, it's really important to regard conflict as an opportunity and not as a failure. Like any dukkha, it's an invitation to meet our limits. And it's much more important that we look and say, yeah, I'm arguing with somebody, or I've fought with somebody, or I've daughters and sons and parents and, and, and friends and neighbors. Um, but I'm aware that I'm defensive and reactive, and that's what's happening. And this is an opportunity for me to meet myself in the mode of defensiveness. 
So the first thing you see, conflict as an opportunity, as a kind of limit, a way we can, uh, like old Dukkha, our teacher, rather than a failure, being a failure or giving up. We see it as our teacher. Being disturbable. <laughs> our disturbability is a real teacher for us. Something can disturb us so easily and we need to look at that and say, yes, I am disturbable, I see that, but that's my teacher. So the next thing is really mindfulness, is watching the contraction happen, watching the reactivity happen. Someone says something to us, you're an idiot, you're stupid. Uh, you can imagine what they say, you know, in conflict zones like in Israel. Uh, you're a soldier, you're a terrorist, you're, a, you're no good, you're attacking, you're defending, you're this, you're this, you're this. And you need to stop and watch the buttons being pressed and turn towards our reactivity with mindfulness, watch the growing reactivity, watch the button being pressed in us with sympathy and understanding, take, take a breath and watch the chain of reactivity. And if we do that again and again and again, we will be less reactive. It will happen by itself. Because we've replaced automatic defensiveness, reactivity. How can you say that to me? Duh. With awareness, with mindfulness. With it. So we need to be kind and interested in our defensiveness and our vulnerability. Say, yes, that's okay. But I'm aware of it. And I don't need to react so immediately and powerfully because instead of that I can watch the process happening inside. And um, it reduces the sense that we feeding pattern of defensiveness. And instead of that we become accepting. We accept ourselves, we accept our defensiveness, we accept our neediness, we allow it, we, but we watch it and we, we be who we are. So I have a small quote. Um, the book, by the way, in Israel, uh, Awakening in Daily Life, is out in America. And that's actually why I'm here. <laughs> um, I maybe didn't say it, but I'll say it again in the end. But it's, it's uh, really to help support the book that I'm run, running around uh, the States at the moment. Um, and um, I just want to give a, a, a quote from the book, which gives a sense, I think it's the whole Dharma in one paragraph to me. So I, just, I would just like to read it to you. And <clears throat> I live alongside lots of olive trees, which have an amazingly expressive character that clearly shows everything that has happened to them. If a branch has been cut, or if the tree reaches out in a certain direction, or lumps are formed on the trunk, you can see it. The shape of the tree is its memory, its sankhara, a response to conditions. The tree doesn't have a problem with that. There is no reason why we should have a problem either. We are also just shaped, constructed by life. We are given a body and it develops and changes dynamically according to conditions. And we arrive in each moment as we are and the world arises and meets us as it is. And all we need to do is to appreciate it and let it be. Stories are just stories. Narratives are just narratives. And embodiment is just embodiment. If we let go into this flow of life, the wounds will dissolve, the scars will be softened and brought back to life, and we will find ourselves in the garden of the now instead of the prison of yesterdays. A difficult experience can come up, just like an unpleasant visitor arriving in our house. We can cry, and the next minute we can laugh, and then he's gone. 
It's just a general summary, in a way, of our dharma attitude to ourselves, as we are, the shape we are, and how we work with uh, difficult experiences that come up. So, of course, mindfulness or awareness is not about um, just our own reactivity. We also need to go out and see the other. And we need to look behind the eyes of the other. And this is where peace is really made. So if we really feel the other, this is, in the Dharma it's called, it's the sacred. Shantideva called it sacred. To put ourselves in the shoes of the other is a sacred act. It's not just a convenient mechanism. It's actually a very big thing. So I just want to give you an example. <coughs> so we had for many uh, years, uh, we brought Israelis, uh, groups of Israelis to the Palestinian territories and the West Bank. And we worked with Palestinians. And um, we stayed with them for um, 48 hours. Um, it was scary for Israelis to go out of their comfort zone and go into Palestinian uh, uh, towns. But we spent the first day on basically helping people to feel safe and calming down and being friendly and having tea together and sh sharing our names and our stories a little bit about our life and so on. So the first day is just relaxing the fears. And the second day we did the inner work. And the core of the inner work was really simple. It was one hour where in dyads, in couples, one Israeli and one Palestinian would just sit opposite each other and really listen to the pain of their daily life. Of their daily life. What is your daily life like? And it, tell me the struggles you're going through. This hour radically changed everything. It, once that has happened, it was irreversible. In other words, the Israeli could never see the Palestinian just as a Palestinian, a potential terrorist, or, uh, an enemy. He's a human being like him, struggling with life, with kids, with, with, with problems, with health, with money, with, with violence in the community, and the vice versa. The Palestinian couldn't see the Israeli as a soldier, but just as a normal human being trying to get through university or whatever. And it, it was radical. So the, 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 the workshop was called The Transformation of Suffering. Suffering was because it's the deepest place of truth. To go to Dukkha is a deep place of truth. It's deeper than just saying, how, you know, what's your name and how you are and so on. It, it, it goes deep. And so uh, we really, um, we really uh, made a big difference to many, many people. And I have to say here something about peace work in general. And this is something that, by the way, I'm teaching... Um, uh, one day at Spirit Rock uh, on this subject on the 18th of the month and um, there's some leaflets there on the table about this uh, one day I'm teaching which is about this the Palestinian authority came to us and said well you didn't really change anything we still have as many settlements and the politics is just as bad what did you do? Did you do anything? They, they couldn't under, They said, no, we are not doing politics. We are doing education. Because we want to show people how they can look at each other differently and then they become peacemakers. A teacher, a Palestinian teacher, knows what he can say to his kids. Now, after having met us, and now I'm going through a workshop. And so we're... we're it's really important, uh, um, and I can't go into this now, 
but that when you work with problems and issues and challenges and maybe some of you are activists that um, you really have to offer what you can in the Dharma without measuring whether you got there, whether you got rid of Trump or you didn't get rid of Trump or without measuring and without uh, a kind of um, uh, all the time success and failure because the contribution goes out in the world. We, did, we didn't make peace. Uh, in the Middle East is, is a disaster. But, there's, but, but what about the Palestinian kid that came to us at the end of one of the uh, one of the weekends and said all my life I've, see, I've had soldiers Israeli soldiers in the street and my view has been that the human heart is nothing but hardness and there is no love in the human heart and after this weekend I have discovered that the human heart is not all bad so well Okay, we didn't make peace in the Middle East. But, you know, this is not nothing. So it's important for you all to, not to measure. So, um, I want to go into um, one or two other uh, ways of looking at, um, at things to, that will help us in conflict. Uh, one of the things, one of the ways which is really helpful, which is wisdom. Again, beyond mindfulness. The wisdom of the Dharma, which is beyond mindfulness. And the wisdom is the big picture. That things are happened because of causes and conditions. Someone can argue with you, they may be having a hard time, and they shout at you. The causes and conditions that created that person having a hard time, you should know that. And then you'll look at that person differently, rather than just being in automatic defensive mode. There's a nice story, Tibetan story, of uh, two people in a market. And they're in the marketplace, two friends, and one got hit by a stick. And he started to shout at the stick. So his friend said, well, what are you doing shouting at the stick? Shout at the hand, tell the stick. Because that's the cause. Oh, of course, yes, all right. So he started to shout at the hand. His friend said, well, shout at, don't shout at the hand because the hand belongs to a person. Shout at the person that uh, uh, hit you with a stick. Oh, oh yes, yes, okay, yeah, you're, you're right, you're right. So he started to shout at the person. And then his friend said, wait a minute, you don't know what's the situation of that person. That person may not have eaten for two days. That person may have had a really hard time and hit you with a stick because of all kinds of conditions. That You have to shout at the conditions that made that, made that person hit you. And his friend said, yes, sure. And he began to shout. And then he realized, wait a minute. The conditions are the whole universe. I can't shout at the whole universe. <laughs> the big picture really changes everything. And if we can see it, you know, in daily life, um, it, 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 uh, so um, another place, um, and I, I'm not going to talk too long because otherwise I know we don't have time for questions. So um, quickly, um, two other places I want to suggest will be helpful in our conflict with other people and with sometimes ourselves of course one is the compassion the heart the heart always produces is an as an antidote is a medicine for situations of defensiveness of reactivity of resistance of shutting down somebody you know you 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 love your kid, your child, or grandchild in my case, that's crying, even crying. But what about the neighbor's kid that's crying all the time, disturbing you? Compassion would say, wait a minute, yes, my kid and the neighbor's kid. Compassion is moving the limits of our heart to include more and more, to heal 
and to be in a new place. So we, we need to push the limits of our heart. Compassion is not so easy in a difficult world. We, have a com- we may have a compassionate heart and we meet a big mess <laughs> of life, samsara. But we still need to push the boundary of compassion to do extra, to feel, yes, I can, I can take one more step to compassion, including them, including the person arguing with me, including... So that compassion is something to remember as also another place to, to work with uh, conflict. And the final point I wanted to bring up, and perhaps the most powerful dharma of all, is uh, equanimity. We will not, we cannot be disturbed if we are not disturbable. And not disturbable means being more empty of ourselves. Really experiencing anatta, less selfing, less me and mine, less defensive, much more spacious inside. Equanimity is really the key to not having needing such an armor outside, protection outside. It's being spacious inside. I remember I was talking about grandchildren, so I want to show you a small story. The other day, um, my two grand, two of my grandchildren were sitting next to me on the couch and screaming at each other, you know, fighting like dogs, shouting, shouting, shouting. <laughs> I think they were six and eight years old. And I was sitting there. They were, the two of them were there and I was the next to it. So I um, decided to be equanimous and do nothing and uh, see what happened. My experience was I felt their anger in the tummy as a kind of vibration. It's not that I didn't feel the anger. That I was like, a, equ- equanimity is not indifference. It's not a wall. It's not armor. It's not non-stick frying pan where things don't stick. Things get inside. So I felt the anger inside, but it didn't go anywhere. So it was here, just in the tummy. A vibration, like a biological chip, like electricity. Oh, every time they shout, oh, I felt it here, coming and going. Nothing, no problem. Didn't do anything, didn't work, it didn't. And after a while, because of equanimity, I could turn to them and say, don't you think it's enough? <laughs> and of course they agreed, oh yes. <laughs> they were quite fed up already with fighting with each other. <laughs> Um, so it's uh, equanimity is a very high place it's the final of the seven factors of awakening it's the final one of the ten paramis Um, and um, and it's high because all senses Everything coming in is in a way raw material for awakening instead of raw material for a problem. Like awakening is everything. So equanimity is a very high place. The Buddha said uh, it's uh, like gold from which you can make anything, any jewelry. It's, It's the refinement. So it goes with a lot of practice, but... It can be in daily life also. Equanimity is there also the beginning of our practice. When mindfulness, we feel a little more spacious, a little bit of anatta, a little bit less me, full of me, me, me. Okay, yes, something is hurting. Okay, I'm with it. Something is not hurting, it's pleasant. Okay, I'm with it. This is happening, this is happening. The thought passing by. It all goes there to equanimity. But at the highest level, equanimity is a very high uh, state. And certainly it's needed in uh, the difficulties of peacemaking. The Buddha once said, if you argue, if you have a, want to talk to somebody and they don't have very strong views or very strong emotions, it's easy. If they have strong views, 
but not strong emotions. You can do it, but it's difficult. Or if they have strong uh, emotions, but not strong views, you can talk to them, but it's difficult. But if they have strong views and strong emotions, forget it. <laughs> don't, talk, don't bother. However, the final message in this text is never underestimate the power of equanimity. And equanimity here is a spaciousness that you bring into your life. You can just imagine, say, in the middle of your work, and people are arguing, or in a board meeting, or whatever, and, and there's arguments, and people are trying to include you in their arguments. But imagine the equanimity, the sense of non-disturbability, and the sense of spaciousness inside, and the sense of allowing things to be the way they are, and allowing other people to be the way they are, like I talked about the olive trees. And, and non-disturbability. You will influence everybody there in that room through that steadiness. And it's very powerful. Equanimity is hugely powerful in modeling peace and peacemaking and non-disturbability. So, um, I think that's what I'm going to say uh, formally. Uh, so, because I, I love a little time for uh, questions and I understand that we have to finish at 9 o'clock. It doesn't give us a lot of time. So we'll have questions for 10 minutes and then I'm going to kind of wrap up at a few minutes before 9 o'clock. So anybody yeah, want to raise something or comment? Yeah, go ahead. I'm so far from equanimity, but uh, this th it's this idea of non-disturbability um, that I don't really understand how to even begin to achieve it because, and I don't think it's because, well, I don't think that it's because myself is involved in it. It's just that um, there are, how do I put this? There are, there are people and the earth all over the world that are being badly hurt. And I'm very disturbed by that. And I don't see how I can get to that path of equanimity or just letting it pass through me without wanting to get up and do something. Mm, I know. So actually, I understand it very well. Firstly, I would say as grand you're probably a grandmother, right? <laughs> or at least <laughs> you, know, you could be. <laughs> so we, we can be equanim equanimous because of our age. <laughs> we can just be, be we've, done the, if we've done it all, you know, so we can actually, uh, the Buddha has a very nice image of uh, 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 grandparents or elderly people kind of sitting on, the, uh, on, a, on a hillside watching the children play. Um, so... I don't think we need to make an ideal of non-disturbability, but I think we do need to watch carefully that the suffering and injustice and difficulty of the world doesn't destroy us. And so, actually, and we experience the fact that if we are not destroyed by the suffering, inequality, struggle, pain of other people, we're not destroyed by that. We have much more power to go out and make change. And so I think it really does need some of the tools I mentioned, uh, not to make an ideal out of, no, I mustn't be disturbed, but to say, okay, there is pain and difficulty in life. There is and there always has been and there always will be. But I'm facing that with some sort of steadiness and I'm going to go out and do what I can to help others. So that steadiness is actually very important. However, don't... You know, when we are disturbed in that now and then and that's okay. We shouldn't be you know, uh, saying, I mustn't be disturbed. <laughs> I have to be totally equanimous. All your meditation will, will take you there, by the way. 
all your meditation, which is presence, which is being at home with ourselves, which is allowing pleasant and unpleasant experiences in the laboratory of our practice, it all will go to helping us to be more steady with what's arising, including when we open the newspaper and we, 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 we read suffering of others. Still, there will be a bit more steadiness there, and I think that's the basis for um, wise action. Thank you. Yeah, anything, anything else? Anyone else? Sure. Hi, how you doing? Um, I was just wondering what city you're in. Mm. So I, I live in um, an ecological village which I uh, helped to found in the Western Galilee. So it's not a city, it's in the countryside with olive trees like I was reading. The, um, and um, it's an ecological village and, and pretty peace-oriented. There are Arabs and Jews uh, hanging out in our place all the time. And our neighbors, we get on with them really well, Arab neighbors, Jewish neighbors. They're, we're living, I mean, the Galilee is actually relatively peaceful. In Are Israel. they Druze or? Druze, Druze and, Ar yeah, we have Druze villages and Druze people coming to us and Arab and Christian and Muslim. And uh, the kids come and play in our place and we go there to their houses. We have a, a real, uh, a, okay relationship <laughs> with the neighbors. It, un unlike what people, people don't know that actually, but there are places in Israel like the Galilee which are really peaceful. And then I was curious, have you, um, did you take um, current IDF soldiers over there? Because you talked about people in the army or were they like ex-IDF soldiers? Because everybody in Israel is conscripted or volunteer or whatever. That's right. Yeah. So obviously we wouldn't take people in uniform <laughs> to meet Palestinians, but, um, but because everybody's a soldier, so some of the people we brought were in the middle of their, so their service, yes? And they had a weekend off, and so they, um, uh, we, they came with us. And so they were actually serving in the army, but uh, obviously they had time off to, to do that. So, um, because everybody's in the army, so it's kind of... Uh, um, they're going to be in the army, you know. Uh, that's it's almost inevitable. Okay. And then, um, did you ever do you ever interact with the um, religious community, <clears throat> like Chabad Lubavitch or the Black Hats, or, or I, I know both sides, and it mm. just seems like impossible. So yeah, I'm yeah. Curious. It's yeah. hard. Um, we we really don't we really don't manage. Well, I would say. Um, in our retreats, we do get quite a few religious Jews and sometimes Muslims and Christians and Druze join our retreats. And our retreats are done in such a way that religious Jews can join. Well, we, don't, we, we allow them to do their rules and so on so that they can join. So we do get quite a few religious uh, Jews who are really interested in Dharma. Uh, but that's different from the peace work. The peace work, we didn't really find uh, religious folk involved. But, you know, I have to tell you a small story. Um, we once did a peace, we did a lot of peace walks all through Israel, uh, which is action. And, and, and even today, a lot of the, uh, the work is action. There was um, people from the Dharma community going out into the Palestinian areas, not just for dialogue, but actually helping them pick the olives so that the settlers don't come and, uh, and, 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 are, and are violent and stopping them um, picking olives. So that actually the Dharma community goes out and helps the Palestinians uh, pick their olives, for example. So we, we, had a, we did peace walks for over years and years. And we once went to um, the chief rabbi of... Uh, of Akkor, the city of Akkor. And uh, we came with uh, Abu Amin, who was um, a Bedouin sheikh, who was one of the leaders of, of the movement. 
And the uh, rabbi said to Abu Amin, Grandfather, um, how do you make peace? And Abu Amin said, um, I mean, he's a real Buddha, this guy. <laughs> he said, um, when I walk quietly through towns and cities, and then someone shouts at me, go home Arab, something like that. I just feel the shout. It goes inside, I absorb it, and it goes, then it vanishes. And not reacting and building anything out of that shout, peace is, that's how I make peace. Which is so lovely. It's exactly what I'm talking about. And he's never meditated in his life, but he, he got it. So there's a wisdom there, he said, you know. But anyway, in the peace activities, we generally um, haven't had uh, contact with the religious communities, yeah. And uh, of course, it's very hard. Yeah. So I think we, we, we've really, it's, it's f just three or four minutes to nine. We, we, d we need to finish right at nine o'clock. Understand? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Roughly okay, so we have one question and then uh, go ahead. Yeah. And to seek out the other's position. But when emotions are running high, do you have a, a prescription or a method for not only in yourself but in the other calming things down enough so that useful listening can actually happen? Yeah. And yeah. useful communication can actually happen. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, of course, equanimity, your equanimity, can really help uh, because it doesn't add fuel to the fire. The key is not adding fuel. When emotion runs high, you can often uh, not add fuel by sort of not really investing in it, not responding on that same level, allowing the emotion to come and allowing it to go. Say, yeah, okay, I understand your feelings, but let's maybe we can move it to another place. So it's not in. It's not giving permission to the cycle of emotion that's from one someone to yourself and back and back and back. So you, the equanimity in you, will not fuel the emotion. So someone can come with a lot of emotion. But, you know, like in Aikido, like in the Japanese martial arts, you know, just allowing the emotion, saying, yes, okay, I see your emotion, I understand your emotion, but, you don't, but let, let it, you know, let it settle down and let's... Let's talk in, in when when take a breath and let's talk. So it, it it's really not feeding it. I think is the main thing. And our equanimity is the key to not feeding other people's emotions. So we present steadiness. The Buddha said the last words of the Buddha: "Be an island to yourself. Be steady." So other people can have emotions all over the place, but our steadiness in the Dharma uh, can make a big difference to other people. I mean, the Peace Walks are an example that we did. Just showing steadiness in the middle of crazy emotions, anger, fear. But just walking peacefully, Jews and Arabs, through Israel. We did it many, many, many times. It presented another way of being. So I just want to... Um, uh, I'm going to say something very strange, okay? So please forgive me. <laughs> it's about Dana. I've got all these books. <laughs> There's a whole box of them there. There is my book. Uh, the it's called What's Beyond Mindfulness: um, Waking Up to This Precious Life. I'd love not to keep carrying these books all over America. So <laughs> the best Dana you can do is is buy a book. Um, <laughs> There's a box there. The price, the cover price is fifteen dollars of the book. But I don't care what you put in the box. I'm just telling you that. Uh, but you're really welcome to buy a book. And that would help me not to have to carry them all over from center to center. I mean, I've got a car here, but um, it, I'm, I'm joking. But that's, for me, uh, uh, Dana. And then there's some leaflets there, because I've started to teach online courses um, in, internationally. And these are deep Dharma courses. These are not beginners. These are courses on 
on self and non-self and infinity, courses on the paramis, courses on uh, uh, on on Paticca Samuppada, the dependent origination. So they're full courses with many many talks by me and and many guided meditations and so on. So there's leaflets there. You're really welcome to pick up a leaflet and um, and then you know if it works out for you, you're welcome to join the uh, online teaching that I'm doing. Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Do you want to finish with